Hello and welcome everybody to the Durham Book Festival. Um, my name is Caroline Beck and it's my great pleasure to be joined this evening by the novelist Sarah Waters, whose 2009 book The Little Stranger has been chosen this year to be the Durham Book Festival's Big Read. So that's the annual free giveaway of 3,000 copies of this great book to libraries, schools, university staff and students, community groups and prisons all across County Durham. So The Little Stranger, which is the book we're going to be talking about this evening, is part ghost story, part psychological thriller and part exploration of a huge class and societal fracture in post-war England. And it's a book that still makes my pulse quicken. And as the nights lengthen, the shadows deepen, and the fireside beckons, it feels like the perfect book to be reading mm -hmm. in October. So it's set in the Warwickshire countryside just after the Second World War in a crumbling Georgian house called Hundreds Hall, which is falling apart around the lives of the owners, the Eyre family. So into this class-ridden world filled with resonating silences comes no-nonsense, rational Dr. Faraday, who becomes involved with the son Roderick, who's suffering from the aftermath of the Second World War, and then the daughter Caroline, at first professionally and then increasingly romantically. But inside Hundreds Hall is something not quite of this world, which no one can explain, the sound and fury of the little stranger. And it's in this haunting that threatens to bring down the whole way of life of the Eyre family. So the film of The Little Stranger came out just a few weeks ago, and very brilliant it is too, capturing the visceral fear present in the heart of the English country house that we all still thrill to. So Sarah, what is it about the country house and the mystery that draws us so much to it? Yeah, we do like them, don't we? Well, we do. Um... I mean, in some ways, I think it's... Uh, can I just start by saying hello? <laughs> it's, very, it's very nice to be here, and it's, it's especially nice to be part of the Durham Big Read um, and for it to be The Little Stranger, which I've been revisiting a lot this year because of the film, and it's a book that came out nearly, um, well, about nine years ago now, so it's very nice to have the chance to revisit it, uh, revisit it and talk about it. And, yeah, country houses, I mean, I think it's partly that they're... They work as a kind of microcosm in a way, don't they? And, and, and that's something that's built into the very geography of a big house. You know, you've got the, the owner's spaces and then you've got the servants' quarters, which are sort of below stairs or behind stairs. You've got the tradesman's entrance, you know, round the back. You've got the grand entrance at the front. Um, you've got the big rooms, the reception room. So it, it sort of works as a, as a little microcosm of, of a larger society in the way that, like, hospitals do, and, you know, they make good dramas as well, um, or department stores even, you know, Selfridges and things like that. It's partly just that, I think, but it's also, for me, buildings, they're just, I just find them incredibly kind of resonant things because they're built to, to sort, to, sort of, you know, as, a, as an embodiment of the kind of social relations of, of the day. Um, and then immediately, society moves on, but the houses remain. So they're almost immediately kind of out of date. Out of date. And, of course, the, the, you know, the more time goes by, the more poignant that becomes, the more they're, they're almost, you know, literally haunted by the age that they were built for. And in the case of big country houses, they were built in a time when, you know, um, they would be lived in by a, a, a small upper-class family and serviced, maintained by a huge you know, number of, of servants. And of course, that's changed dramatically within British society. So it does make them very odd and interesting places, I think. Is it something also to do with um, the light and the dark? Because if you think of country houses at the time that most of them were built, there was no electricity. So there are, you know, there, there are these corridors full of darkness, which seems to sort of uh, absorb you in. So they are, they are automatically a place of secrets. So a great place for a novelist to really get stuck in. Yes, I mean, there's certainly lots of room in them. I think all houses, <laughs> even small houses, have room for secrets. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, just, I mean, Wilkie Collins had this wonderful phrase, you know, he, he wrote The Woman in White, he was talking about... Um, domestic life, and because what you know, what Wilkie Collins did with with a novel like *The Woman in White* was to um, was to take some of the stuff that had previously belonged to like Gothic castles and bring it into the kind of middle class Victorian home. That's why they was, those novels were seen as so sensational. You know, they were they were uncovering bigamy and madness and 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 cruelty within the home, not in some far off exotic Gothic location. And he had this phrase, "The secret theatre of home," which I think is such a wonderful phrase. 
And as I say, I think that can be played out in quite small houses, but certainly the bigger the, bigger the house, the more, the more room there is for strange things to be going on um, in the attics, you know. And of course, they replicate... How all houses, I think, replicate our idea of, of the psyche, which we often think of as having dark sort of subterranean bits that we don't like to visit very often. Or that and the mad woman in the attic. In our dreams, yeah. you know, or, or there's the mad woman in the attic. Things that get put out of sight, but that sometimes re-emerge in inconvenient ways or frightening ways. And it's also a place, uh, the country house, where different classes butt up against each other. Mm. There was a fantastic... Uh, exhibition on at the, at the big country house near us in Northumberland, Belsay. I don't know if any of you remember it, but uh, it was full of people looking through keyholes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether you, you, this is resonating with any of you, but it would be full of people looking through keyholes and finding out what was going on and all these sort of secrets unspoken. And, of course, everybody wanted to look through the keyhole because everybody yes. wanted to spy on, on what was going on. Yes, and, of course, one of the extraordinary things about those large houses where, as you say, the classes were kind of living very intimately together is that, you know, you had this sort of subjected class, the servant class, which, of course, had its own very strict hierarchies, it, you know, within it, but privy, you know, to the, to the secrets of the upper classes and overhearing things. I mean, as you say, for a novelist, there's an awful... Uh, there's a great deal of scope, you know, for kind of na narrative tension. Of course, The Little Stranger was a bit different because the house started off like that, but now it's 1947 and it's lost its, lost its servants and it's falling apart. So it's, it's, it's haunted by a way of life it can no longer, amongst other things, it can no longer sustain. So when you found out that The Little Stranger was going to be um, the book festival's big read, did you go back and reread it? Because it's, what, nine years old? Maybe it's ten. nine years old. I, did, I haven't reread. Well, actually, I, the only book of mine I've reread was Tipping the Velvet, and it was such a sort of... <laughs> it was kind of funny experience. It was, it was, you know, it was my first novel, and it was 20 years ago since it was published, but longer since I actually wrote it. I wrote it in 1995. So I was obviously much younger. And it's full, it's got, it's full of a kind of youthful energy, but it's all I wanted to do was kind of correct it and rewrite it and oh. re-edit it and take, take a red pen to it. I think, and I suspect even with a book, you know, that I've written more recently, like The Little Stranger, I would... I mean, it's like, for me, reading my own stuff, it's like, um, you know, it's like hearing your own voice on tape or something. I mean, it's just kind of, just kind of excruciating. So, no, I didn't reread The Little Stranger, but I've been revisiting it a lot in terms of thinking about the story and the themes this year be because of the movie. You know, and, it's been, and were you involved nice. in, the, in the making I of the film? I wasn't creatively involved. I've never... I mean, I've had... S how many adaptations have I had now? Well, all of them except for The Paying Guest, my last book. So, um, you know, it's, it's been a very interesting process each time, but I've never been creatively involved. But to be honest, I've never seen that as my role anyway. You know, I'm always already on another book, so I... Yeah, you know, it's much better to hand it over to somebody who can just be dispassionate um, about paring it down to its essence. But I've definitely been um, and liked to be um, included in the process, involved in what's going on. So with The Little Stranger, that was right from the very beginning of meeting the production company, Pot Boiler, and then meeting Lucinda, the scriptwriter, Lenny, the director, and then going on set one day, on location, I should say, because it was at, at, a, at a big old house where they were filming it, and watching a bit of the filming. So it's been, um, it's, you know, I just find that kind of side of it fascinating, just seeing the, the process, because it is a real translation, and, you know, what can work on the page can't necessarily work exactly on the screen. So there have got to be changes made. Some things seem to leap from the page onto the screen and just, you know, come to life. So it's, it's a very interesting technical process, I find. So the title, The Little Stranger, I remember when I, I first came across it. So the word little is very benign. You think of mm. something which is harmless. But stranger comes with sort of darker connotations. So I wondered where that title came from. I think it's partly that I admired Donna Tartt's title, The Little Friend. <laughs> <laughs> I always admired that. And I think part of me thought, oh, that would have been quite a good title for this book in a way. Mm. Um, and then I thought, hang on a minute, um, what about The Little Stranger, which you might know has often been used as a phrase to talk about unborn children. Like in, say, a Victorian, or even later, a kind of advice manual to mothers-to-be, you know, when The Little Stranger arrives, you know, make sure you've got this, that, and the other. And in that context, it sounds quite nice and quite charming, but actually, if you think about it, it is a slightly sinister phrase. Um, yes. So I just, it just felt, it just, I mean, of course... You can talk about what, what or who it refers to, but given that the, you know, Dr. Faraday is such a central character in the novel and he comes into the house 
as a kind of stranger, although he has connections to the house. Um, and he appears to be rather benign. You know, it seemed, to, it seemed to fit very well, but it also seems to fit this thing that emerges, this kind of poltergeist or whatever that starts terrorising the house, which is kind of small, but, mm. but, but cruel and destructive. And malevolent. And malevolent. Mm. Yeah. So let's talk about Dr Faraday, because um, the name itself, you know, he's, he's a doctor, uh, he's a rational man. Um, I mean, the, the name... You, you must have got the name from the original character of Faraday, did you? Well, do you know what? I didn't, really. Oh. It just sort of... It's funny with names. It's one of the most... It's one of the more um, fun things about being a novelist is choosing names for characters or for, you know, houses. Um, because you sometimes... Sometimes a name comes immediately and it, and it feels absolutely right. And sometimes you scout around for a name and then you find it and you think, yes, that's the name. And I think with Faraday, it just sort of came along... I didn't give it that much thought. I may even, maybe at the, even at the start, thought, well, maybe I'll change it later. But then, of course, it stuck, and it, that just became what he was called. And it was only much later that, well, I think in reviews, where people talked about Faraday cages, electricity, you know, Dr. the original uh, Michael Faraday and his experience with electricity and the idea of... And somebody, you know, was like, well, Hundreds Hall is like a kind of Faraday cage. But, but I hadn't thought of that at all. Even, you know, even Dr. Faraday, if you've read it, he... He comes along with this kind of electrical gadget to help Roderick, the son who's got an injured leg from the war, and he sort of wires him up. And, um, and I, think he, I think they're actually called Faraday, you know, they use Faraday induction coils or something I discovered, but that was, maybe it was somewhere in the back of my brain, but I certainly didn't do, do that deliberately. Um, it's funny, he doesn't have a first name. No. Which wasn't something I <coughs> planned for at the start, but I realised increasingly that nobody was calling him by his first name, and it, it felt significant about him as a character, you know, that he's over-identified with his professional status. He's come from a working-class background, so he's sort of cut off from his background, but he's not accepted into the upper-class world that he sort of secretly wants to belong to. He's not even really accepted into the kind of just the ordinary gentry world. Um, and, yeah, so he doesn't... He's not intimate, intimate enough with anybody for anyone to call him by his first name. So I realised that, that it, was, it felt right, you know, to do that. And in fact, but it, it, people have often said to me, what was it like having a male? It was my first male narrator. And um, it was interesting because I felt actually quite close to quite, you know, given that ultimately he's revealed as not a terribly pleasant character, I felt quite, um, quite identified with, with Dr. Faraday. And of course, I realised that one day, one day I realised that I am, in fact, a doctor because I've got a PhD, and it was a really weird moment. It doesn't sound like very much. And in the film, they have, if you've seen it or would, will see it, there's one point where they, um, you see the exterior of his surgery, and it's got his brass nameplate, and it's Dr. Faraday. And the, the initial they chose was S, Dr. S. Faraday. And there's kind of a reason for it later in the film. But it actually gave me quite a turn because I thought, Christ, maybe his name's Sarah. You know, maybe it just like... <laughs> It was really <laughs> peculiar. Um, but, of course, him not having a name, you know, it fitted in nicely with things like Rebecca, you mm. know, the nameless heroine of that. And um, so, uh, yes, but no, the surname, it just... It was just, just popped up. Just popped up. And he's a very credible witness when we first meet him, isn't he? Because he's the main narrator. And, you know, he's a doctor, so he comes with a, a fair amount of sort of kudos anyway. But he's sympathetic, isn't he? He's very sympathetic to Roderick, knows that he's suffering with his bad leg and sort of goes in, massages his leg. Um, he's, uh, he's, he, he's got... Uh, you know, he picks up. He's got enormous empathy. And you like Dr Faraday. You think he's a good man. And then slowly... He unravels a little bit. So, mm -hmm. did he start off by being a good man, and he did he? How, how, at which point did he start unraveling for you in the book? He started off as being much more of a, re a remote character on the sidelines of the story. Actually, it was oh. Betty, bizarrely, the the maid oh. um, who was more central, because the novel I, has a very clear genesis for me. Um, it partly came out of work I'd done on the Night Watch, which was a book I'd written before, which was set during and just after the Second World War in London, and it was, that's much more about um, sexuality and gender, really. It was about the kind of queer... I mean, actually, the strange liberations that people could find in wartime, you know, women doing kind of exciting jobs and, and people having love affairs and living for the moment and things like that, and then that also kind of closing down after the war. 
Um, but I, you know, I, I kept coming across class as a big issue in wartime and, and post-war world. So that's, that was kind of a starting point for me. And there's a novel called uh, The Franchise Affair by Josephine Tay, some of you mm. might know, from I think 1947, which is actually based on an 18th, fascinating 18th century case about a girl who goes missing and turns up bruised and battered with a sort of story about what's happened to her. And Josephine Tay turns it into this rather rep fascinating but rather repellent story about this working-class girl who claims she's been abducted by two women living in a lonely house, who sort of, sort of middle-class women who sort of abused her and tried to make her be their servant. And It's a really interesting book, but it is quite unpleasant. And it's very... It's very, um, it's got this kind of loathing of the working classes in it, which is, for me, I could see, you know, in the literature of the time, coming out of the Second World War, the working classes, you know, were on the up, very deservedly, um, voting in a socialist government, welfare state, you know, the, a meritocracy, when I mean, it hasn't panned out quite that way, but, you know, there was, this, there was a time when it looked, it, you know, Britain was really changing, and that was great for lots of people, but for people like the heirs is the family... Uh, in The Little Stranger, it was a very threatening time. You know, they felt like they were going to be kind of engulfed by this rising, yeah, sort of rabble, I think. And The Franchise Affair encapsulates that. So I kind of thought, could I, could I like, rewrite The Franchise Affair from the point of view of, of Betty, Betty Kane, the girl who's demonised in that novel? And I really tossed that idea around for a while. And then I was at Dartington Hall, another literature festival, lying in bed one night, remembering that I'd been there the year before, uh, the book before, and had a nightmare. I'd woken in the middle of the night, kind of shrieking, thinking there was somebody in the room, a figure at the end of the bed. And I started thinking about ghosts and poltergeists and teenage girls and poltergeists. And I thought, hang on a minute, maybe this book about the tensions uh, around class in the post-war world, I could tell it as a kind of haunted house story. And Betty was still at that point kind of a focus, and Dr. Faraday was this kind of friend of the family who was going to relate the story in a very classic ghost story way, you know, an M.R. James kind of way. He wasn't really involved. He was telling us this story he didn't really understand. And it was I actually kind of began to write it like that for a few months and then just found him really interesting. And as soon as I thought, well, maybe he's not a middle-class man, maybe he's got this complicated class background of his own. And then I thought, well, maybe his mother's actually been a servant at the hall. How would that be? You know? And then poor Betty kind of receded mm -hmm. then um, and just, just has a... I mean, I actually quite like the character of Betty. And if you see the film, the actress playing Betty, Liv Hill, is wonderful. She really does a lot with her. Um, but, yeah, it was Dr. Faraday and his tortured kind of... No, it's not tortured exactly, but his, the mixture of admiration and... Uh, envy and bitterness he has all mixed up together and you know he really wants that house and he wants that life in that house but he also kind of resents it and it just made for a very interesting mix I thought. Can we hear a little mm. bit from the beginning of the book because actually everything you need to know about Dr Faraday <laughs> is very delicately unravelled in that in those first few pages not that you know that when you start the book but actually when I went back and reread it I thought it's all here. <laughs> His whole character is here. It is, and I didn't. I wrote the ending quite near the end. Um, sorry, the beginning quite near the end of the writing process, mm. which I think is the best way to do it, really, because that's when you know exactly what you want. Uh, you know, what's your way into the story, and also to lay those seeds that aren't necessarily mm. going to bloom until much later on. So yeah, this is um, this is from just at the just at the very start. I first saw Hundreds Hall when I was ten years old. It was the summer after the war, and the Ayres still had most of their money then, were still big people in the district. The event was an Empire Day fate. I stood with a line of other village children making a Boy Scout salute while Mrs Ayres and the Colonel went past us, handing out commemorative medals. Afterwards, we sat to tea with our parents at long tables on what I suppose was the South Lawn. Mrs Ayres would have been 24 or 5, her husband a few years older. Their little girl Susan would have been about 6. They must have made a very handsome family, but my memory of them is vague. I recall most vividly the house itself, which struck me as an absolute mansion. I remember its lovely ageing details, the worn red brick, the cockled window glass, the weathered sandstone edgings. They made it look blurred and slightly uncertain, like an ice, I thought, just beginning to melt in the sun. There were no trips inside, of course. The doors and French windows stood open, but each had a rope or a ribbon tied across it, the lavatory set aside for our use were the grooms and the gardeners in the stable block. 
My mother, however, still had friends among the servants, and when the tea was finished and people were give, given the run of the grounds, she took me quietly into the house by a side door, and we spent a little time with the cook and the kitchen girls. The visit impressed me terribly. The kitchen was a basement one, reached by a cool, vaulted corridor with something of the feel of a castle dungeon. An extraordinary number of people seemed to be coming and going along it with hampers and trays. The girls had such a mountain of crockery to wash, my mother rolled up her sleeves to help them, and to my very great delight, as a reward for her labour, I was allowed to take my pick of the jellies and shapes that had come back uneaten from the fate. I was put to sit at a deal-top table and given a spoon from the family's own drawer, a heavy thing of dull silver, its bowl almost bigger than my mouth. But then came an even greater treat. High up on the wall of the vaulted passage was a junction box of wires and bells, and when one of these bells was set ringing, calling the parlour maid upstairs, she took me with her, so that I might peep past the green baize curtain that separated the front of the house from the back. I could stand and wait for her there, she said, if I was very good and quiet. I must only be sure to keep behind the curtain, for if the colonel or the missus were to see me, there'd be a row. I was an obedient child, as a rule, but the curtain opened onto the corner junction of two marbled floored passages, each one filled with marvellous things, and once she had disappeared softly in one direction, I took a few daring steps in the other. The thrill of it was astonishing. I don't mean the simple thrill of trespass, I mean the thrill of the house itself, which came to me from every surface, from the polish on the floor, the patina on wooden chairs and cabinets, the bevel of a looking glass, the scroll of a frame. I was drawn to one of the dustless white walls, which had a decorative plaster border, a represent representation of acorns and leaves. I'd never seen anything like it outside of a church, and after a second of looking it over, I did what strikes me now as a dreadful thing. I worked my fingers around one of the acorns and tried to prise it from its setting, and when that failed to release it, I got out my penknife and dug away with the blade. I didn't do it in a spirit of vandalism. I wasn't a spiteful or destructive boy. It was simply that in admiring the house, I wanted to possess a piece of it, or rather as if the admiration itself, which I suspected a more ordinary child would not have felt, entitled me to it. I was like a man, I suppose, wanting a lock of hair from the head of a girl he'd suddenly and blindingly become enamoured of. I'm afraid the acorn gave at last, though less cleanly than I'd been expecting, with a tug of fibre and a fall of white powder and grit. I remember that as disappointing. Possibly I'd imagined it to be made of marble. But nobody came, nobody, nobody caught me. It was, as they say, the work of a moment. I put the acorn in my pocket and slipped back behind the curtain. The parlour maid returned a minute later and took me back downstairs. My mother and I said goodbye to the kitchen staff and rejoined my father in the garden. I felt the hard plaster lump in my pocket now with a sort of sick excitement. I'd begun to be anxious that Colonel Ayres, a frightening man, would discover the damage and stop the fate. But the afternoon ran on without incident until the bluish drawing in of dusk. My parents and I joined other Lidcott pe people for the long walk home, the bats flitting and wheeling with us along the lanes as if whirled on invisible strings. My mother found the acorn, of course, eventually. I'd been drawing it in and out of my pocket, and it had left a chalky trail on the grey flannel of my shorts. When she understood what the queer little thing in her hand was, she almost wept. She didn't smack me or tell my father. She never had the heart for arguments. Instead, she looked at me with her tearful eyes, as if baffled and ashamed. You ought to know better, a clever lad like you, I expect, she said. People were always saying things like that to me when I was young. My parents, my uncles, my schoolmasters, all the various adults who interested themselves in my career. The words used to drive me into secret rages, because on the one hand, I wanted desperately to live up to my own reputation for cleverness, and on the other, it seemed very unfair that that cleverness, which I'd never asked for, could be turned into something with which to cut me down. That green baize curtain. Yes, please do. Please. Please do. Okay. Oh, glasses off. <laughs> that green baize curtain is the metaphor, isn't it? Because actually, the rest of the book, he tries to get across that <laughs> green baize curtain. And uh, I mean, he does, but he doesn't at the same time. Yes, he does and he doesn't. I mean, we can't, I don't know how many of you have read the book. It's a hard book to talk about without sort of giving spoilers. But, I mean, basically, he, uh, well, as you said at the start, really, he, he gets 
kind of drawn into a relate friendship, first of all, with Caroline, the daughter of that, the grown-up daughter of the house. And then, it, and then it becomes like an odd sort of romance, an awkward romance. And one of the big reasons it's awkward is because for her, who's, you know, she's maintaining this, she calls it a lovely monster or something at one point, this house that's like eating up the family energy, eating up what money they've got left. Um, she's been drawn back to look after her, her brother, um, she's had quite an exciting war. You know, she's been in the Rens, kind of having fun, really. So she's been drawn back to this lonely, miserable place. Um, so she sees him as kind of a way out, but of course she, she, he sees her as as his way into the house. So it's really it's, it's it's a doomed relationship. But he's very conflicted, isn't he? Because his mother was a nursemaid. Was a, a nursemaid looked after the children in the house. And, and she was. Was she a nursemaid? She was because at one. I shouldn't really be telling you about it's your quite own a home, while. Yeah. I? But at one point, it would make um, sense. Mrs. Eyre <laughs> says, "Oh, go over there, dear, and look at a photograph." And he looks at a photograph. And he thinks it's his mother, but because of the photograph, the, the, the face <laughs> is blurred. Yeah. Um, and he's not sure whether it's his mother or not, but he feels the sense of shame that his mother worked there. But again, he almost wants to... He, he loves the house, doesn't he? He loves the house and he loves the, the, the family within it. Yeah, yeah, he loves the house, certainly. I mean, who wouldn't, you know, not, you know even, even if we might, whatever our class politics, you know, those, those houses are extraordinary things and be often beautiful things. Um, and, that, you know, he feels, however reasonably, that he has a kind of empathy with the house, I suppose, and understands it and knows what's best for it. I mean, it's a bit like Tom Ripley, if you've ever read the Ripley novels, Patricia Highsmith novels, you know, who starts off as a kind of nobody and then through a life of kind of psychopathic crime, acquires a bit of money <laughs> and, you know, surrounds himself with very tasteful things and learns, learns to play the harpsichord in the end. You know, continually meeting people, kind of, kind of um, brash, rich Americans who have no taste at all. You know, he's got much better taste than they have. And I suppose Dr. Faraday, I don't know whether he is like that, but he certainly sees himself, you know, as having a sort of, well, he talks about, uh, you know, a sense of entitlement to the house because he feels like he appreciates it. Um, so, yeah, it's a funny... He, he definitely feels that bond with the house, however real or not it is. And he also... He, he, wants, to, he wants the family to like him. He really does. Um, and they can react with him um, in a professional capacity because he is their doctor, and he increasingly kind of insinuates his way into the family and makes himself invaluable. Um, but at the same time, he'll never be part of them. He'll never be part of that society. And there are very subtle points in the book where they keep letting him know that. Yes, and yes, I mean, he keeps sort of hitting up against that, really. And, don't, and um, Lenny Abrahamson in, in the film and Donald Gleeson playing Dr. Faraday, you know, there were some great moments, very, very subtle moments, where he's sort of put in his place. But, I mean, it was, you know, making him a doctor was... The reason I made him a doctor initially was because I needed him to be mobile and I needed a reason for him to keep coming to the house, you know. Yeah. So he starts to treat Roderick... And then um, he just becomes a bit, um, uh, you know, they begin to rely on him in all sorts of ways. So it gives him an in, you know, his profession gives him an in. But this was a time when doctors, you know, there was still a distinction between like a gentleman doctor mm. and, a, and, a, and just a doctor who was a kind of like a, a businessman. I mean, it's just before the NHS. The NHS just starts at the end of the book, really. And, um, you know, lots of doctors were very resistant to the NHS because they were small businessmen in competition with each other and they, 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 they just didn't... They thought the NHS was just going to kind of undercut that. And it was a very, it's, it, that was a big surprise for me when I started researching doctors in the period, just how much hostility to the NHS there was. So, in a sense, I think Caroline makes this point to him at one point. You know, doctors had a sort of, and maybe still do had a kind of investment in, in, in people being unwell because <laughs> it kept them in business. Mm. And, and, of course, doctors have that funny relationship with people. They see them at the most vulnerable. I mean, they, they, see, you know, they look at their bums and things like that. You know, it's very... You're very intimate <laughs> with somebody as a doctor, but it's not, a, it's not necessarily a pleasant intimacy, you know, and you don't necessarily then want to go to a dinner party and see your doctor <laughs> if he's just looked up your bum, do you? You know, so it's a very odd... Socially, it's a very odd <laughs> role, I think. Let's talk about Caroline, because, she, as you mentioned before, she's had a good war, like so many women did. They mm. had great wars, didn't they? And then they had to come back and resume this life of sort of pretty dull servitude. And um, she's sort of locked up. She's a very vibrant woman. She's in her late 20s, locked up in Hundreds Hall, falling around her, her ears. Um, 
And th there's a lovely part in it. Every time the Dr. Faraday sees her, um, she's, <laughs> she's out blackberrying. She's got her head in a, in, a, in a hedge or whatever. And she seems to be really part of that countryside, much more, and the life around her, much more, really, than when she's in the hall. And she always seems a little bit uncomfortable in the hall. Yes, it's true. I hadn't thought of it like that. But now you say it, I think she... Well, also, of course, she's grown up with the hall. So it's, it, you know, it's glamour doesn't work on her in the same way as it works on uh, ordinary people like Dr Faraday. So, yeah, she's much happier out of the hall she, with her dog, Jip kind of striding along. Mm. Um, yeah, once she's back at the hall, once, I mean, it's in the hall that, that horrible things happen, increase, you know, that, in, that increasingly happen. So for her, I mean, lots of, in lots of my novels, women are kind of trapped uh, in, in houses, and this is just another one of them, I guess. And when yeah. Dr Far Faraday first sees her, um, he, he sort of internally notes that her legs are bare, um, and they're, they're tan, so she's obviously been outside quite a lot, and they're hairy, mm. and he's quite shocked that her legs <laughs> are hairy. And as soon as she sees, Caroline sees him looking at her legs, she tucks them up underneath her. Another kind of restraint that she feels within the house that she clearly doesn't feel outside. Yes, that's true. I, mean, I was very struck reading the research I, I did for this novel. Um, lots of the, cause This was a period in which um, you know, lots of middle-class women had to do without servants, not just women in big houses, but just, you know, in sort of modest houses who traditionally would have had a cook and, and maybe, and certainly, some, certainly somebody to do the cleaning. They might have still kept a woman, a daily woman, coming in to do the, the roughs for them. But um, they were, you know, middle-class women were having to do lots of their own housework for the first time. That's why, you know, you get books like How to Run Your Home Without Help, you know, that one that Persephone have re reissued. I mean, this is from, like, the 20s onwards, you, you would be getting this. Um, but in lots of novels of the period, there's a thing about women's, not legs actually, but hands, yes. women being ashamed, middle class yeah. women having, especially went through, you know, when they'd been through the war, being ashamed that their hands were really rough and red and chapped and, and sort of, you know, noticing that men kind of glance at their hands and then kind of look away embarrassed and sort of hiding their hands. Um, so it was a, yeah, there were these bits of the body, I mean, as there always are for women. You know that, are very, that were very always under scrutiny and always were very loaded and meant meant you know had sort of moral significance or so you know a bigger social significance. So yeah, he talks about Caroline's hairy armpit at one point. Mm. Not that it's hairy, but that she's got a bit of stubble on stubble. it when they go to a dance. But I always saw her as this very just this very not well earthy is a funny word, but you know just just a woman with a woman's body for goodness sake. You know what I mean? Um, and he's both kind of attracted to that and a bit freaked out by it. And a bit repulsed by yeah. it, actually, isn't he? Yeah. Let's talk about Roderick, um, because yes, Roderick time. has been um, very badly affected by the war. And it strikes me that a, a, another haunting that goes all the way through the book is the effect that um, the war has upon men. Now, upon Roderick, it's had a physical effect, and that, that's the way that Dr Faraday actually gets to meet him, because he's got a, a leg that's been injured. But there's, uh, the war seems to run and haunt all the way through this book, I think. Was that your intention, or did it just come out like that? No, it was, it was very much my intention. I mean, that had been a big thing of, from the, in The Night Watch, the book before, you know, that these pe people were living in the ruin, you know, not just a ruined city, um, but sort of they were in emotional ruins. They'd all been through kind of tough things during wartime, and they were at the point where they might be just about to start recovery. But... Um, uh, you know, that they were still dealing with the aftermath of war. And I did have that in mind with this book, simply because it, you just, you know, it was something I just kept coming off, across again and again in, in the fiction I was reading from the period. Um, it wasn't until, I think, well into the 50s, really, that, that, that I mean, of course, rationing stayed for a long time, didn't it? You know, it was, that, there was that austerity that just hung around for a long time. Um, but yeah, I mean, we think of shell shock. We associate shell shock with, with for men with, with the First World War, don't we? But actually, I mean, yeah, there were it was there were those dreadful injuries that were also you know psychological injuries. There's a, like just throwaway comments in it. There's an Angela Thur I don't know if anyone's read Angela Thurkle, but she wrote these kind of light social comedies um, in the period that are kind of insanely readable, although really conservative. But and she mentions at one point somebody has a man a friend come to stay. And she says, I've put you in a room that doesn't have a telephone in it because I know that, you know, the sudden, the sudden, sudden noises might, might make you a bit edgy. You kind of think, oh, yeah, actually, you know, this, these were people, you know, these were, the women of the period were, were surrounded by men who, you know, might be jumpy or, 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 or nervy or, 
yeah, it's it's um, and of course we've all you know in our families you know we might have a lot of this. I mean, it's classic that, that men didn't talk about their experiences after the war. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's one of those things that filters down through families in quite interesting ways. As the book develops and the haunting within the book from The Little Stranger um, uh, and the claustrophobia of the house becomes more and more intense, the book I think I was most reminded of was um, Henry James's The Turn of the Screw, uh, again, set in a country house full of shadows, um, two children, two sort of innocent children, and this sort of haunting coming from within and without, and uh, a, a female who may or may not be imagining it. Was that book in your head when you wrote this, or was it on the periphery? Or, or How did that book feed into it? Because it must have at some level. Yes, it could not not be in my head, really. Yeah. That was one of the interesting things about writing a haunted house novel. Once I'd committed to do it, which I did with great glee, because, you know, I was somebody who grew up reading a lot of ghost stories and watching a lot of horror films. And um, suddenly to, to think, yes, I can, I can write a spooky novel of my own. I mean, lots of my novels have kind of gothic elements, but this was, like, really going for it, proper supernatural element. Um, and certainly, it was interesting how I just, without even trying, you know, as soon as you set it in a in a in a in a country house, you 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 um, evoke things like um, turn of the screw. And actually, I'm not a mad fan of the Henry James novel itself, but something, but the story definitely, and the film, The Innocents, the Deborah Carr oh, film from yeah. the '60s, which is the most fantastic adaptation of it. Um, that and the haunting. The Haunting, that's another 60s horror film, isn't it, which is great. The Haunting, Haunting of Hill House, but I think mm. it's just called The Haunting. Um, I just, yeah, I just found that they were almost evoking themselves as I was writing the novel. You and, say you're, yeah. you weren't, you're not a fan of the Henry James. I just, I'm not yeah. a fan of Henry James, really, okay. as a writer. I just find him so bloody e elliptical and what? I'm like, what? What do you mean? What? <laughs> like that every single time I kind of read him. So I'm hoping, I always think when I get to my, into my 60s, suddenly, I don't know why, suddenly Henry James will make sense. Um, <laughs> but I just get very impatient with Henry James. But as a story, I mean, who couldn't like The Turn of the Screw? You know, it's fantastic. The elements of it, I love. Um... So, yeah, there was that. There was the yellow wallpaper as yes, well. Yes, yeah, I was going to talk about th th that book as well. Um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, which I think was written in about the 1890s, mm. The Yellow Wallpaper, a terrific book. We heartily recommend it. Very, yes. very short, but it's deadly a sh short book. short story, really. It is I've a seen short it story. in short story yeah. collections. Yeah, absolutely brilliant about a woman who's um, just had a baby and is nervy and edgy. It got post postnatal depression, really. And as it, she's been given a rest cure, put in this, taken to this house by her husband in the country, middle class woman, so she doesn't even have much contact with the baby. There are servants around. And she's put in this room that, what, that was clearly once a nursery, or was it? Anyway, there are bars on the window. There was strange kind of. Anyway, it's got this horrible yellow wallpaper on it. And she becomes increasingly, because she's shut in all the time, she becomes increasingly obsessed with these patterns on the wallpaper and she's slowly losing her mind basically it's the most fantastic depiction of insanity and starts to imagine see female figures skulking about behind the pattern of the wallpaper only sort of sh at night shake the bars and it's absolutely brilliant isn't it oh it's um, a terrifying book so of course i had wallpaper i thought well what color can the wallpaper be <laughs> it had to be yellow you yes know, and the book in the in the big sort of yes. round room that was the thing when, uh, when as soon as you mentioned the yellow wallpaper i thought was that book in her mind of course it must have been because uh, there's even the, that sort of uh, feeling of things coming out the wallpaper even at that point i think yes because of course mm. things start appearing in the house yeah. don't they burn marks and things like that that i really enjoyed doing that yeah i bet you did mm -hmm. so <laughs> i want to ask actually about your research because I know, I mean, you mentioned earlier that you've got a PhD, and so I imagine that you're a pretty <laughs> good researcher. I bet you are. Um, and I'm wondering how you did the research. I have this sort of uh, thing in mind that you went around lots of Georgian stately homes having sort of scones <laughs> and tea all over the place at the National Trust's expense. But um, did you do that? I did visit a few. Yes, I did. I looked for ha houses that were like, I, you know, like Hundreds Hall as I was imagining it. And I deliberately went for a Georgian house because I thought, I'll go for the kind, the house that's least spooky looking. You know, I could have, it could have been like a Victorian Gothic pile. It could have been sort of medieval, Elizabethan or something, not medieval, but, you know, Elizabethan kind of dark oak floors and panelling. I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make it harder in a way by, you know, having big square rooms and big windows letting in lots of light. Um, so I, I really wanted, and also I like, I just like Georgian, Georgian houses. And you live in a Georgian I house. I do live in a Georgian house, not like Hundreds Hall, I have to say, <laughs> a, a very small one, a small terraced house. But there is something lovely about, I mean, 
Georgian houses, there's just, I don't know, the proportions of them are very pleasing. But I think, I think for me, it's because, I think the George, I mean, except my house is built in the 1790s. And I think that's about as far back as I can go and still feel uh, like I understand society, society, understand people. I mean, certainly this is why I liked writing about the Victorians. You know, I felt that they were different from us, but the, the, I, that lots of their jokes are funny. You know, you can watch um, Gilbert and Sullivan and laugh at some of the jokes, if you can bear Gilbert and Sullivan, you know, or Dickens. I mean, lots of Dickens is kind of opaque and tiresome, but then you just get these bits that feel incredibly modern. And I think the 1790s is about as far back as I can go. It, before that, it just becomes a bit stranger. The clothes become more exotically historic. Um, I don't know. So, you know, certainly in my house, I, f you know, I think a lot about who's lived there in the past and who has walked down the stairs and put their hand on the banister, you know what I mean? So that, I suppose that was partly why I chose a Georgian house, that just that I like them. So I did go and visit a few and picked, picked things I like. I mean, there's, I mentioned there, there's that junction box of... Mm. Well, be bells. bells. I mean, you see those, like, very classic Downton Abbey, isn't it? But there's, there's a house up park in Sussex, which actually burnt down and they rebuilt it. But I think that, I remember, I think it's there. I was very struck by this junction box and realised, of course, that for those things to work, there have to be wires running right through the house, through, the cav through cavities in the walls, uh, you know, arriving at a, 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 a thing you pulled or a button you pressed or something in a, in a room. And I love the idea that these houses that look so solid had all these kind of nerves running through them, connecting the posh people upstairs to the drudgy servants downstairs. You know, it was a very interesting idea. So just things I remember seeing Roderick in his room. He has a, like a chain mail curtain over his fire, a fire guard curtain. That was, I mean, you see those around, but I hadn't seen one until I saw one in this Georgian house. So I picked any, any bits that I liked the feel of, really, that felt right. But Hundreds Hall is arguably the central character of the book, I think. And, and it becomes more and more... Uh, well, it's, it's a completely implacable enemy, but it's very malevolent as well. And you talk about these sort of bells and, you know, it's all linked up with these the kind of wires running through it, and it becomes more and more terrifying. But is it the house that becomes terrifying, or it's the, it's the thing that animates the house, isn't it? There's mm. something loose in the house that's exploiting... I haven't thought, haven't thought of this till now. That's exploiting those things I've been talking about, I suppose, the distances between the classes in the house and the reliance, the, this odd, this weird... Well, the very real reliance that, you know, the, the, the toffs would have had on the servants to do very basic... perform very basic functions for them. So, in a way, the... Th that what's loose in the house is kind of getting its revenge on the family by exploiting those things, if that makes sense. When I first read the book, when it, when it was published in 2009, I was much more taken with the, the sort of supernatural element, I think. When I reread it for this event, I was much more taken with the kind of coercive control. I, I think that because that's become, that's become yeah. much more, um, you know, f focused and highlighted upon in, in recent years. And it seemed to be much more a book about this sort of tight control rather than the poltergeist. I know mm -hmm. you haven't reread it actually, but when you've seen the film, does it come across like that or is it? Yeah, no, definitely. Mm. And it's, it's been very interesting. You know, I was, I was looking, at, uh, looking for references to The Little Stranger on Twitter when the film was out, um, just to see how people were liking it. And of course, I, you know, people were tweeting about the novel as well. And somebody used this phrase, toxic masculinity about Dr. Faraday, which, is a, which wasn't a phrase in use when I wrote the book, but of course is absolutely appropriate for Dr. Faraday um, now. Um, and that's definitely something, that, that's the kind of thing that, that um, Lenny Abrahamson, when he, in directing the film, had in mind for Faraday, and he does emerge as this increasingly controlling and unwholesome kind of figure, yeah. And he unravels, doesn't he, Dr. Faraday? Does he? think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think he does. Well, a I bit of him does. unravels, but I don't know if it's... Um, yeah, that's interesting. I'm going to throw it open to the audience because I'm sensing that you've got lots of questions to ask Sarah. Sarah, I wondered um, what you thought the importance of ambiguity was in um, a gothic novel like Little Stranger and then how difficult sometimes it is to convey that ambiguity in a film or a television adaptation. Yes, I mean, I was very... Uh, that was on my mind when I was writing The Little Stranger because I didn't... 
I feel if, so, you know, if something genuinely, genuinely supernatural is happening, it's, by definition, you can't tidy it away. You, know, you can't wrap it up. And so I wanted to do justice to that idea with the, with the novel, although I also wanted to suggest that... I, I wanted to hint that there is something very clear going on that is, that is, and the biggest hint comes at, at, with the very last line of the book. Um, but lots of, lots of people have found the book to be ambiguous. So I now kind of make a virtue of necessity and say I meant it to be really ambiguous all <laughs> along. Um, but I, what I really wanted it to be was subtle, actually. Um, and it was, perhaps I made it a bit too subtle. But then again, when people do seem to have got what I was trying to do. It's very, very satisfying, you know. In fact, even if it takes a while, when I was looking on Twitter, somebody, somebody said, God, if there was ever a backhanded compliment, you know, she said, oh, I read The Little Stranger last year, and she'd given it, like, a, just a couple of stars on Goodreads or something. She hadn't been that impressed with it. And she said, but it's really stayed with me, and I think now if I was going to, I'd give it more stars. And in a funny way, that was really pleasing to hear, because, it, you know, the idea of, of it staying in her head and kind of fermenting away and just taking time to reveal itself was just very, very satisfying to me, even if it, even if it failed to give her that immediate kind of satisfaction that maybe she would rather have had at, at the time. Um, and in the adaptation, I don't know if you've seen the film or plan to see the film, but they do something very interesting about that because film does tend to have to be less ambiguous. Uh, audiences tend to want something a bit more satisfying. And I think Lenny did just, just did a really good job of, again, he leaves it to the very end. And he does something that's slightly different to the book, but is very, very true to the spirit of the book and very, very faithful to the book, even, when it, even though it's quite different. So, um, it, yeah, I was very, very pleased with that. I was very pleased with it, actually. Yeah. It's definitely a book that stays in the mind. When I reread it, I say I hadn't read it for nine years, it was remarkably fresh. Was it? Oh, incredibly fresh, yeah. yeah. And I'm very sceptical about ghosts. <laughs> I have to say, that does make my heart palpitate a little bit. OK, so have we got any other questions? First of all, can I just say thank you? Uh, we don't we read your novels, and we don't always get a chance to say thank you for two decades. Absolutely oh. wonderful, oh. wonderful oh. fiction. <laughs> Honestly, you shouldn't say that sort of thing to a menopausal woman because I just cry at the drop of Who's there? Thank you. Um, my my question is: um, you make your characters really uh, live and breathe, so we all, they're like real, almost like real people to us. Um, and uh, my question is, when you've completed a novel, Sarah, do the characters still live on in your psyche? And like Nan and Kitty and, <laughs> and Maud and Sue, do, do you ever think about what happens after the plot? And do you, does that ever lead into a sequel, idea of a sequel? <laughs> do you know, it sounds absolutely heartless, but I don't. I don't imagine pictures <laughs> for them. I just don't. They just, work, they just serve the book for me. That does sound heartless. But what isn't heartless is that I really miss them when I finish a book. And I really missed Caroline, for example. And my last book with The Paying Guest, there were two women in it, um, Lillian and, and Frances, and I really missed them. Um, because, you know, you, do, you have to put a lot of emotion in. I mean, it, this was a, for me, this was a relatively quick book. It was only about two and a half years, but now it's taking me more like four years to write a book. So, you know, you do have to spend a lot of emotional energy on your characters. And I was very fond of Caroline. Kay in The Night Watch, if you read The Night Watch, I was also very fond of. So it was really, I did really, really miss them when I, when I finished the book. So in that sense, they, they lived on for me. You know, they stayed with me. But no, I, no I've never really imagined, no, I've, cer I've certainly not imagined sequels. Although, hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, to what extent did you... On, I'm over I here. I see you. Where are I? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to what extent did you set out to write about masculinity? And if you didn't, at what point in writing the book did you realise that that was what you were writing about? Hmm. Um, I didn't set out to. You know, he just felt like the right character for this story. Um, and to, the extent, to what extent did I realise I was writing about masculinity? I think only in that... You know, as soon as I put him in a relationship with a, with a woman, I was drawing on um, lots of the currents that we know exist in relationships between men and women in a, in a sexist society, and that particularly existed in a particular way in the 1940s. Um, 
when to be an unglamorous woman, you know, was a deeply kind of, was, a fa- was to be a failure, really. I mean, the worst thing you could be in the 1940s and 50s, I mean, forgive me for anybody who knows better than me because they actually lived them, but it seems to me the worst thing you could be was a brainy woman, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, it was just, it was, they was, you were seen as so sexless. I mean, it was just like the worst thing to be. And Caroline is, is, is a brainy woman. So I wanted the men around her to, um, to enact, you know, some of those assumptions about, about women. Um, and actually, you know, they probably would have been saying far more horribly sexist things about women than I made them say because I, I didn't want to make Dr. Faraday kind of, you know, too, re- too repellent, really. I wanted him to be quite sympathetic. Um, and by the standards of the time, I think he is quite... He's quite a nice... I mean, you know, there's, there's Dr. Seeley, who's the creepy... The octopus. Um, <laughs> my mum... There was a man that my mum and her friends called the octopus when she was a young woman. He was always giving women lifts and things like that. And, you know, it's just been a staple of women's lives forever, really. Um, so I was, I, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't part of my big agenda for the book, but it was just there because it had to be there, really. Yeah. Thank you for all your books. Um, I was wondering, you write really well um, about queer characters and about queer subjectivity, and quite often... There's a lot of gothic themes in those, those novels. I was wondering if you had anything to say about the relationship between queer characterization and subjectivity and gothic themes. Well, I think historically there has been quite an overlap, hasn't there? Um, I mean, certainly when I was writing Affinity, my second novel, which was partly about Victorian spiritualism, you know, the research I did into spiritualism suggested to me that... Um, that queer people, for what you know, for want of a better term, that's an anachronistic term, might have found a home in spiritualism because it allowed for a slightly more looser idea about, uh, you know, that you might have an affinity with somebody regardless of your of your sex. You know, it might it might transcend sex and gender, and that that was that was kind of interesting. Not that that not that um, not that uh, spiritualism is is gothic in itself, but I think. I think that, yeah, there just has been a kind of overlap, right from people like um, Walpole and Strawberry Hill, you know, people right at the start of what we think of as Gothic literature. Um, they have themselves had queer interests, even, even right through to something like Rocky Horror Picture Show, which was the thing you know, which I saw when I was, which I saw with my boyfriend, who then came out as gay, you know, <laughs> and what both of us watched at 17 or eight, oh. 18 at most, watching the Rocky Horror Picture Show, was the most amazing experience because it was the first time I had seen queer people, you know, be kind of cooler, funnier, sexier than straight people. It was just an absolute revelation, and that's a kind of jokey, um, a jokey kind of re- um, reflecting on on the on gothicness and, it, and and its kind of queerness. But I think, nevertheless, it's it has always been a big part. Whether that will change now that in our society, at least, queer people don't have to be living in the twilight in the way that they have done historically. You know, whether that will change or not, I don't know. Um, I suspect it will, but of course it's still very current for other parts of the world. I don't know. Where did your interest in the supernatural come from? Is it from more of a personal experience or an intellectual interest? I'm thinking in particular about affinity that you've just mentioned. Um... It's only per- I've not had any personal experience of the supernatural, and I used to think I would quite like to. Um, and then I was approached by the West Yorkshire Paranormal Group, oh. who took me... <laughs> Where did they take they you? They took me to Plasnewid, which is the Ladies of Langothlin's house oh. in Langothlin, if you know it. Ladies of Langothlin were, you know, a couple of women, two women who, who set up home together romantically, really, and they were sort of celebrities of their day. Wordsworth went to visit them and things like that, and they lived in this in this gothic little home in, in, in uh, Slangothlin, which is sort of oak-panelled and very, very atmospheric. And we went there overnight with all the ghost-busting kind of cameras <laughs> and cold spot detectors and things like that. And, you know, turned the lights off, and they were like, if, there's any, you know, if there are any spirits here, please make yourselves known to us now. You know, taps. And I was like, I just thought, nobody, please, no, no, just nothing. <laughs> because I just felt like... I mean, kind of Roderick talks about this in The Little Stranger when he begins to be haunted... You know, he, it, there's this thing called ontological shock that people suffer when they have supernatural experiences because it shakes your, the foundations of your... You know, if, if something could move across a table, then what's to stop anything moving? You know, what's to stop 
as flying apart or something. I find it quite a disturbing. But I think because I find it so disturbing as an idea is why I'm so drawn to it. I think it's really interesting. And I'm really, you know, intellectually, I mean, on an intellectual level, I'm really interested in why, why everybody has a supernatural story to tell. You know, why across cultures, across history, we have this need for the supernatural. You know, why ghosts? And it's, of course, it's, it's about our own difficult <coughs> feelings, our difficult emotions about grief and death and... Um, guilt, do you know what I mean? It, it's just a, the supernatural, the gothic, the whole gothic realm is just a fantastic way of manifesting things from, from in our own psyches, I think, and in our own troubled social relations. Um, so I do, but yes, I mean, even, even as a child, I was, I was drawn to it. I just, the idea of there being something else, I think, is just very, very interesting. Um, so it just remains for me to thank Sarah for a fascinating talk. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming. And thank you, the audience. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.